uh, we basically let folks arrive. We'll keep uh, keep uh, uh, inviting them to introduce themselves, right? And uh, depending on you know if we reach 9:30 or not, we can um, we can basically. So when Alva joins, then we can we can do the talk, right? So I see David is joining. Hi, David. Um, so uh, basically, uh, let me start. Uh, and also, we have uh, Jeremiah Coleman, who is the one of the uh, Stanford quantum folks. And last time I mentioned that we are welcoming uh, new community organizers. We really want to open this up. All right. So what what I uh, I'm gonna do? I'm gonna just you know introduce myself and maybe introduce Jeremiah. And maybe Jeremiah can ask you guys kind of to continue. Let's see how this goes. So. Um, uh, so I'm Alexey Krabrov. Uh, I'm the organizer of uh, this uh, Quantum Conversations. If you guys are joining us for the first time, um, uh, I think I, I mostly see folks who, who were here before, but basically uh, it was supposed to be a physical series of meetings uh, originally organized with IBM, right? And in the Bay Area. So, you know, that's why we're so happy to have Stanford Quantum with us, which is the biggest, uh, I think, uh, student group at Stanford. and probably in the Bay Area um, uh, of folks interested in this, right? So the original plan was, you know, let's do these meetings uh, in San Francisco, let's host them at Berkeley, at Stanford, at UC Davis and kind of local places, right? And kind of Quantum West, uh, it was called, but obviously uh, the, the pandemic struck and we had to rethink that. So we did uh, meetings online and uh, we continued uh, to, to do that um, since. So we, we do this every last Wednesday of, of the month um, and we are now doing one main talk, right? So we did a couple, but for some folks it was too long and uh, we're trying to do this in the morning so we can capture some of the European folks who want to join us, right? So that's, and so today we're gonna have one talk. Uh, I see Alba is joining, nice. Um, and so, okay, so that's kind of, you know, uh, uh, me and uh, I'll let Jeremiah introduce himself. And after that, uh, we'll, you know, the hardest problem uh, of computing will be how we, you know, go along the list uh, asking everybody just once. So we'll see how we can manage that. So Jeremiah, take it away, introduce yourself. Great, no, yeah, thank you, Alexi. Um, so as I'm Jeremiah, um, I'm a current senior at Stanford University. I study engineering, physics and economics. Um, with concentration in quantum science and quantum engineering. Um, as Alexi mentioned, I'm the president of the Stanford Quantum Computing Association. Um, and my like interest, I guess, lie in kind of quantum hardware. I had an internship this past summer with Google Quantum AI as a hardware research intern. Um, and I'm excited to be here again. I'm, I'm glad to help facilitate this um, quantum conversations and hopefully get Stanford more involved and bring more of the Stanford community along with it. Thank you. Uh... So maybe, you know, me and you can kind of go down the list and, and, and ask folks to introduce themselves. So I'll just start with Alba. Alba is our speaker and she is joining us. So Alba, introduce yourself in a, a kind of under a minute. And then, of course, you will have more time to, uh, to uh, uh, elaborate when you, uh, uh, when you do the talk. Sorry, did you ask to introduce myself or? Yes, listen okay. to yourself, like we'll do one minute introductions as we go down the list and then... Okay, will... okay, nice. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Alba Cervera. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the University of Toronto. I'm working in Alana Spurugruzi Group, Matter Lab. And I'm working in uh, near-term quantum computing, uh, computing tools as I will present today, and also new algorithms, etc. But my, my background is also in quantum information. So I have some backgrounds in foundations of quantum info like Bell inequalities, multi-partite entanglement, etc. I study physics and also particle physics. So I also did some works on entanglement in particle phenomena in particle physics phenomena. And in general, I'm interested in anything related with quantum computing, but also in quantum information in general. Thank you. And obviously, you're the speaker today, so I'm looking forward to your talk. Um, let's see, uh, Amir Ibrahimi. Hey there. <clears throat> uh, my name is Amir Ibrahimi. I'm out here in West Marin, California. Um, I work at Unity Technologies in our labs group on a, uh, a machine learning, uh, deep learning, inference engine called Barracuda. Mm -hmm. And uh, my story is that I'm bootstrapping in, in the realm of quantum computing until I become a useful researcher. Very good, great to have you again. 
Uh, David Maciotti. Hey, Alexi, how are you doing today? All right, how are you? All right, good. Uh, so I'm a professor at University of Chicago. Uh, here in Chicago today, we have a bit of sunny weather, which is good. Uh, my interest is in quantum chemistry and quantum information. Uh, so all things quantum, certainly very excited about uh, some of the research uh, happening on quantum computing and looking forward to today's talk. Great, great to have you back, David. Uh, Indranil Day. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Indra Nilde. I am from uh, Bangalore, India. So I basically work with JP Morgan. And recently I've started my journey on quantum with our uh, research team in JP Morgan. So I am, I think I am just a novice I've started. And this is the second uh, uh, quantum conversation which I'm attending. Great, welcome. Uh, let's see, Nicholas Sabaya. Hey, Alexi. Hey, how's it going? Uh, my name is Nicholas Sawaya. I finished my PhD a couple years ago in Alana Sparaguzic group also. Um, so say hi to him when you see him. Uh, I did a PhD in chemical physics and uh, that was after undergrad in mechanical engineering and chemistry. Uh, I'm now at Intel Labs in Santa Clara where uh, there's two of us working on quantum algorithms. So I focus primarily on, uh, I guess, algorithms related to Hamiltonian simulation. And, uh, and also new applications in chemistry, especially spectroscopy and uh, vibrational degrees of freedom. Great, yes. And I want to say we met with Nicholas at the Simons Institute uh, and little we knew this would be one of the last physical meetings, uh, right? We could enjoy uh, in, in, in uh, the area, but you know, this is thankfully we can do this online. So great to see you. Uh, Likewise. Rishi Sridhar. Hey all, uh, my name is Rishi and I'm a master's student at Chalmers University in Sweden. So I'm, uh, I'm, I did my bachelor's in electrical engineering and I'm trying to pivot into physics, more physics and quantum. And uh, my thesis was on using tensor networks to model variational quantum algorithms like QA way. So using tensor networks, uh, you can sort of study how, you can play around with entanglement and uh, study how loss of entanglement affects the performance of these algorithms. And so I'm really excited for today's talk. Uh, yeah. Great, welcome, welcome. Uh, Sasha. Okay, hello. Um, my name is Augusto Gelois. I'm in Argentina. I did my master's in physics. Uh, a few years ago, I started doing financial work. I did a, met this team in, uh, through JP Morgan. The, the first uh, chat, I think, or the second one, and then I'm been coming here, and now I'm doing a lot of financial work, but I am still really trying to get involved into the quantum things because I, I enjoyed a, a lot of when I was doing my master's. So I try not not to leave that. Great, welcome, and you know, uh, I, I I see a theme actually. Uh, there are several folks who are uh, currently um, software engineers in more traditional setups, especially in the Bay or you know, other uh, software companies. So, I, and actually I started receiving uh, uh, requests from my friends for software engineers who want to actually pivot into quantum. So maybe we can have, you know, we have time, maybe today, you know, after the main talk. Uh, so I said, you're here, you, right? Like there are several folks who, I think you know, kind of pivoting. Maybe we can have a little bit of a discussion, right? How folks go about it, because I think it's kind of a recurring theme. So, uh, because we have one main talk, but we have you no know, additional time, we can use it uh, whatever way we want. Uh, Jeremiah, do you want to take the like uh, you know uh, uh, moderate uh, subsequent introductions? Do you yeah, feel like of course. To? All right, take it away. That's great. Yeah. Um, oh, Song Zhang. Hi, uh, I'm a PhD in uh, Berkeley from Brigitte Valley's group. So my focus is on uh, quantum feedback control and quantum error correction. So I just would like to hear about what Tequila can do into this talk. Thanks. Great, awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, next we have uh, Wim LaVision. Start this video. Hi, I'm Wim LaVision, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. 
Uh, I got this email forwarded from uh, Bert de Jong. I work both on the advanced content testbed from DOE, I work on the, the software stack, and then in Bert's group, I work on uh, classical optimizers for graphic uh, QAOA, et cetera. Awesome. Great. Thank you. And I think also, Eddie Fari, you joined a few minutes ago. If you want to introduce yourself real quick. Hi, my name is Eddie, and I um, I, I work on quantum algorithms. I just somehow got a random email about this. I thought it'd be interesting. <laughs> I'm home all the time, so I thought I'd go to a meeting. You know, I work I work for Google, but I have an affiliation still with MIT, and I'm in Brookline, Massachusetts today. So I'm interested right. just in what's going on. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Welcome, yes. And then also, uh, last but not least, uh, Zhiyun Zhang. Oh, hi, everybody. Uh, this is Zhiyun Zhang, and I work at the Stanford Research Computer Center, and I'm a computator, uh, computational chemist. I'm very interested in algorithms in quantum, uh, in quantum chemistry uh, and, and, and uh, quantum computing, and I'm working on some related projects right now, and I'm really looking forward to today's talk. Thank you. All right. I guess that's about everybody. Thank you, Jeremiah. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, we'll we'll you know keep adding folks uh, as they join. Um, uh, but uh, I think now we can proceed uh, with our main talk. Um, let's see. Okay, Diego Garcia Martin is joining right now. Let's do one more. Uh, hi, Diego. Introduce yourself. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Diego. I'm a PhD student at uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and I work on quantum algorithms. Great. Welcome. Uh, so we have Barcelona connection. It's awesome. Really cool. Uh, we can all be in the city physically, but we can remember it right through the folks who, who are there. Uh, so uh, our main talk is by uh, Alba Cervera Lierta. Uh, uh, it's really great, you know. Uh, she was introduced uh, by uh, uh, to me by by uh, Sebastian Hasselberg from my IBM, who is again uh, basically a founder of the series. So it's really exciting uh, to expand uh, our field. Uh, Alba, I'll let you introduce yourself again. Uh, so the you know the way we do the uh, Q and A's. Uh, you guys are welcome to mention uh, them uh, to, to ask questions in the chat, right? And and everybody can see them. And so, Alba, you can also see the questions. And, and it's really up to you when you want to take questions. And obviously, at any point, you can just ask questions, and folks can 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 just you know uh, ask questions by voice. So so it's really up to you how you want to manage it. You know you you you. And obviously, in the end, we'll we'll have a general Q and A session. Um, so with that, uh, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Alexei, for inviting me to these talks and to give me the opportunity to present this uh, this uh, this project, Tequila. Uh, yeah, I'm Alba Cervera Lierta. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the University of Toronto under the supervision of Alana Spuruguzic. And my background is in physics and particle physics and also quantum information in general, like bell inequalities, multipartite entanglement, etc. And the last years I've been working in quantum algorithms, especially in near term quantum algorithms at the end of my PhD. I finished my PhD last year in uh, also in Barcelona. So I know Diego for, because of that. And, and yeah, under the supervision of Jose Ignacio La Torre. And now I'm here in Toronto the last year and during my postdoc. So thank you everyone for, um, for joining me in this talk. And please interrupt me at any, at any moment because I probably will not read the chat while I'm presenting because it will be difficult to switch all the time. So please just interrupt, interrupt me at any point and ask whatever question you prefer or in the chat and afterwards we can just continue discussing that. Okay, so I will uh, share my screen. Let me... Okay, can you see my screen now? Okay, perfect. So today I'm going to present the designing variational quantum algorithms with Tequila. Tequila is a quantum language that my group has developed during the last year. 
and it's an open source quantum uh, language so everybody can just check the code and contribute if you want so we are more than happy to accept contributors and suggestions comments whatever so it will present uh, how this uh, how this package works so first of all why tequila why we need this kind of languages then i will go for and i will describe in more detail tequila api and then i will go to the basic usage like how we construct quantum circuits, et cetera. And then I will move to things that are in general more interesting, which is chemi chemistry examples and quantum machine learning examples. We have much more examples in our tutorial sections and, and that's it. And then I will close with what are the current projects that use Tequila and what are the future features that we would like to add to the, to the code. So please interrupt me at any, at any moment, and as I said, but yeah, uh, as I will, as you will see, I will first present all the features one by one of Tequila, but at the end, I will just present everything uh, wrapping up. So it will be probably more useful to understand how it works with uh, concrete examples. So as you know, uh, we are in the golden era of quantum languages. We have many of them, many are appearing. Uh, we have IBM's uh, Kiski, we have CIRC that is used by Google. We have PyQuil used by Rigetti. Kibo, which is uh, using for a startup called Kilimanjaro. Uh, Q Sharp for Microsoft, Penny Lane from uh, Shanadu, and many, many more are appearing. In the end, everybody that is developing a quantum computer is also developing the language to program that quantum computer as it's natural. Uh, but not only that, we are also in the quantum software, we have many quantum software tools that help us to, to run these algorithms in quantum computers. We have Orchestra from uh, Zapata Computing, Mythic, which is uh, for error mitigation, and Qlex, which is a nice quantum simulator. And we also have other tools related with quantum simulation, uh, in particular for chemistry, like Sci4 and Open Fermion, and of course, many, many more. And not only that, but we also have all the classical tools that are useful for the near noise intermediate scale quantum computing era, which are the like optimizers and, and the analytical gradients, etc., that are needed for uh, optimizing these quantum circuits, these variational quantum circuits. So in the end, we have uh, tons of languages that uh, in principle we have to learn and we have to implement in our algorithms. So for us, in particular for me, sometimes it's difficult to you know, remember how to program and how to use all these languages, uh, especially if you want to, for instance, compare different quantum computers. So in the end, we never know which language should I use it the first time that I started to design my algorithm. Like, should I start with Qiskit or should I start with Circ or with any other? Because maybe at the at, uh, in the middle of my of my work, I decided to run my algorithm in a different quantum computer. So I need to write again the same algorithm. Uh, which is, you know, a, sometimes a waste of time for me as a theoretician. So uh, it will be very useful to have something that uh, takes into account all possible languages. So I only wrote my code once and I can run it in different uh, backends easily. Not only that, but imagine that I wrote my code in Circ, but then I started to collaborate with people from IBM and I would like to share my code with them. So I need to have a platform that I can easily share my code so they can use the, uh, my code with their own language. And not only that, but also what happens if I just started to use one language and at some point it becomes obsolete because nobody is supporting that anymore. That could happen also, especially in, in uh, at this time that many things are, are happening and are changing all the time. So I need, uh, I would like to have a code that will work, you know, forever. So I, I can share it with everyone. It will be there. And it doesn't matter if the particular backend that I use change or have new features or just becomes obsolete. So I can still use my code in other backend. So in the end, that's the general idea that is behind Tequila and our motivation as a, as a, physics, as a theoretician in quantum, inform, in quantum computation. We wanted to develop a language that works with any possible backend. And uh, so for us, it will be easy to test different algorithms in different places. And that's what is Tequila. So it's unification, standardization, and acceleration. So we don't have to waste time in checking, uh, in, in translating our code to another language. So we just focus on writing the code once in Tequila language, and then we just choose whatever backend we prefer, the one that is more suitable for us. And not only that, but we also can add more features to that, like noise models, error mitigation, et cetera, and more than we are working on. 
And that's the idea of tequila. And you can check the code, it's available and in our group repository. And we are working in the in the documentation that will be available very soon and also on the release paper. But uh, everything is written in the in the GitHub repo and in the tutorial section is super useful to understand how this works. But anyway, I will present how this works in, in more detail and some examples. So first of all, as you know, we are in the noise intermediate scale quantum computation, which means that uh, we mix together a classical algorithm, a classical software tool with a quantum hardware tool. And we are in this era because the number of qubits that we have is not enough to perform error correction. So our qubits are noisy and we only have a few of them. We have and now currently 70, 50 qubits uh, working in 100. Uh, probably in the next years we will have more than 100, but still is not uh, 1 million qubits that are the, the ones that we will need for error correcting uh, quantum algorithms. So in the end is we have a bunch of things and we will try to put everything together and produce something that is useful for us, something that we call quantum advantage, something that outperforms classical computation. So that means that we have different qubit architectures. That means that the topology of the chips is different. So not all, not all qubits are connected and, and the topology changes uh, drastically from one chip to, the, to another. We have few qubits, we have noise, we have the, the coherence, we have any other, so, other sources of error like crosstalk, et cetera. And on top of that, we have classical optimizers that help us with the, with the variational algorithms and are very helpful and they are working towards quantum advantage probably in the near term. So in the end, that's the, the big picture of it. And, and we want to generate some language that will help us to wrap everything all together to produce this something useful, which is the quantum advantage experiment or experiment or algorithm. So the question is, what can we do with a few qubits and how can we deal with the noise? So what can we do with, few, with a few qubits? That's why I use the MacGyver picture because it reminds me sometimes to, to that series. I don't know if some of you are, uh, are familiarized with that or not, but I used to saw this show when I was a kid. And the idea of having, you know, a small resources, anything works perfectly, but still you can do something useful. So that's what we are trying to do with uh, in, in quantum computing nowadays for achieving this quantum advantage. So for that, uh, we have these hybrid quantum classical algorithms, as I said, uh, sometimes also called variational algorithms, uh, which are really useful because they mix the best of both worlds, the quantum uh, hardware machine, and then the classical optimizer and all classical tools that are in the in this classical optimization optimization part. And the uh, application of this noise intermediate scale are from chemistry to quantum machine learning, uh, materials, etc., and also optimization problems. And in the end, the problem with these applications is we also need to compare and benchmark the results with the classical techniques because we cannot claim quantum advantage if we cannot if we don't compare with the current state of the art of the of these of these problems. So in the end, uh, we have many quantum computers in development, and we need to benchmark, compare, and test them. So we can really say if. Uh, if the, we have achieved quantum advantage or if we are working towards quantum advantage in a, in a clear manner. So these are the software players that uh, Tequila manages. Uh, on one side, we have the, all the abstract manipulation of wave functions, quantum gate definitions, the noise models, etc. On the other hand, we have all the classical tools that from optimizers, from gradient methods, also computational chemistry methods that are also implemented. And then uh, all, all these things work on top of the quantum backends that can be both real experiments or just quantum simulators. So this is, uh, I will start with the Tequila API step by step. And as I said, the, the code is available in, in our group repository. So you can check all the, all the modules that I will present now. And this is the, the general picture. So in general, any quantum algorithm, we will start with a Hamiltonian, which is an operator. And this Hamiltonian somehow will codify our problem. Could be a molecule, could be a, an optimization problem, could be many things. But in the end, we need an operator. 
And then we have a quantum circuit that will generate this, uh, an state uh, that could be parameterized, in general will be parameterized for variational quantum algorithms. So uh, what we want is to compute the expected value of this operator uh, from the wave function generated by this quantum circuit. And depending on this expected value, we will optimize it, et cetera, or we will perform some operations on top of that. In many cases, we can generate this quantum circuit using a particular ansatz that is physically inspired, which is the case in quantum chemistry with the unitary couple cluster ansatz. And that will be also useful to have some tool that translates our Hamiltonian and generates automatically the proper ansatz. So uh, we, Tequila also implements the, in the, this part and in an automatic way, so you don't need to know all the subtleties or how, how, do you, how should you construct these ansatz. And as I said, these Hamiltonians, in many cases, if we are working in quantum chemistry, will be a molecule. And we have many tools to, to translate the molecule into the proper Hamiltonian by performing some transformations that Jordan Wigner, for instance. And we have already these tools, a program in Open Fermium, Sci4, and other uh, chemistry backends. So this is also implemented in Tequila. So it will be very easy to call these backends to generate the, the proper Hamiltonian. And once we have that, together with the quantum circuit, we compute the expected value, and that will be our goal. With this expected value, we construct the objective function, which is the core of tequila. So tequila works with objective functions, which means that uh, we can construct an expected value and then generate an objective function that is much more sophisticated than just an expectation value of the Hamiltonian. So for instance, we can construct any kind of function that is compo composed of these expectation values. And this objective function is the one that will be compiled into the quantum backend that can be either simulator, a simulator or a real backend. Currently, we support CIRC, Qiskit, PyQuil, and Qlex, and we are working in new ones. So that will be the goal of Tequila is to expand these uh, quantum backends as much as possible in the end. So uh, we can easily translate our code to any possible backend, depending on, you know, on, on the application of your code. And here is where we can, if we are dealing with simulations, we can also implement some options like noise models and also sampling. So we can decide if we want to obtain the results by sampling or just by simulating the exact wave function using a simulator like Qlex, for instance, that works with, uh, with the wave functions. So then with this backend, uh, we will go to the optimizer and the result of the quantum, of the quantum backend uh, will be uh, translated in this uh, classical optimizer. And here is where we have to decide the method that we want to use for, for minimization, the method options, the gradient, the initial values, etc. And here we currently support uh, some uh, Bayesian optimization optimizers, but also analytical gradients and, and of course SciPy and well-known uh, minimization algorithms. And this optimizer, we just uh, propose a new set of, of, of variables to our quantum circuit, and we close the, the well-known loop of variational quantum algorithms. Parallelly, we can also um, gener um, simulate wave functions, draw the circuit, define gates from Hermitian operators, so it shouldn't be uh, control node gates or rotational gates like well-known gates. We, also, we can also generate any kind of gate that can be represented with an Hermitian operator. This is also supported in Tequila. So let me uh, move step by step on all these parts of this tequila API in more detail. So first of all, the, as I said, the current quantum backend supported are Qlex, Qiskit, Circ, PyQuil, and also a symbolic one. And uh, you can check uh, the available ones by just typing uh, tequila show available simulators. And as you see, Qlex, um, all of them uh, support the wave function simulation. Some of them support sampling. Some of them support noise, etc. So, in top, uh, besides these quantum backends, we also have uh, two uh, chemistry backends, which are um, Open Fermion and Psi4, uh, that also will be useful for generating the Hamiltonians of, of our problems if they are chemistry problems. The basic quantum uh, gates that we have. Sorry. Uh, I was wondering, could you elaborate on the symbolic uh, backend? That sounds interesting. I'm not familiarized in particular with this symbolic backend. So it is know that is uh, uh, implemented in Tequila, but uh, especially for wave functions will be very useful. So it's uh, the only thing that I can say at the moment. I'm not familiarized with this particular backend, but maybe Jacob, after we, uh, we finish the, the presentation, Jacob, which is the, the principal um, researcher involved in this project can elaborate a little bit more. 
Great. So, Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. So as I said, the basic quantum gates that are uh, now implemented are rotational gates, as you well know, the rotational Y, X, and Z, et cetera. And then we also have the phase gates, Pauli, and Hadamard, and a swap gate. And all, many of these gates uh, accepts the control and target, which means that we can just call the rotational X gate, for instance, and can be a single qubit gate or can be a control uh, qubit gate by any controls. Uh, we can just select as many controls as we prefer, but we should take into account that if we want to run this in a real backend, probably this gate will not be supported. So this is useful, especially for quantum simulator simulation. And some gates also accept the power, which means that we can uh, just call the X gate, for instance, the Pauli X gate, and uh, ask for a, and, and use the power uh, and compute the power gate of that gate. And we also have the phase gates, in general, any possible phase, but in particular, uh, S and T gates are already defined. And of course, Hadamar and swap gates. We also have more sophisticated gates. So for instance, we can uh, generate any possible gate, as I said, if we have uh, the, Hermitian, the Hermitian operator. So this is the exponential Pauli string. So we can just call that gate and give a, a Pauli string and the killer will generate the corresponding gate. And we can also trotterize our gates. So in case that we want to run some trotter decomposition, we can also use that in Tequila and we have to provide the generators, the angles and the trotter steps, of course. And all these gates, uh, as I said, accept control and target, which means that we can trotterize, a, for instance, trotterize a gate and then ask for the control uh, to perform this gate with um, as many control qubits as we would prefer. So then uh, we have the objectives, which is, as I said, the tequila core. So this class represents the mathematical manipulation of all the expectation values. And these are some examples of how can we construct the objective. So we can have an objective that is just the sum of two expectation values, like E0 and E1. Or we can have an objective that is uh, some power of some expectation value. And we can even multiply and manipulate these ob different objectives all together to generate another one. So in the end, these objectives are constructed by, the, by computing the expectation value, and then and they are compiled into the quantum backend. So then I will present more uh, some examples of these objectives uh, in, uh, in this talk, uh, in particular, for instance, for quantum machine learning applications. Then we have the optimizers. Uh, the function is uh, tequila minimize. And there are many arguments that are accepted. The mandatory ones are, of course, the objective. So what, what's the quantity that you want to minimize or to optimize? And the other one will be the method to use. Uh, so for instance, gradient descent or L, L, LBV, LBG, oh, sorry, I always forgot how to pronounce that. Anyway, any Adam optimizer, et cetera. And then for quantum simulations, we have uh, other possible uh, arguments. For instance, the backend, if, if we want a quantum simulator or we want a real backend, we can just call that like Qiskit, Circ, or Qlax, et cetera. We can decide if we want to sample or not. If we don't sample, uh, Tequila will automatically uh, um, simulate the exact wave function. We can also call the device. So if we want to run our circuit in a specific real device like IBM Quantum uh, Tokyo or, or any other, then we can also call that. And we also can uh, call the, any noise model. We can construct our, our noise model independently and then call that function as I will present after this slide. And additional keywords, of course, are method options, variables, initial values, gradient, silent the outputs or not. So this is something that is easy to understand if we, you start to play with it. But as you can imagine, uh, it's all, everything that is needed for, um, for minimizing any, any, any function. These are the current optimizers supported in, in Tequila. As I said, SciPy optimizer, also many gradient descent based optimizer. And also some Bayesian optimiz optimizers like Phoenix or JPI op optimization. Then in gradient methods, we can decide which kind of gradient we want to compute. So we have analytical gradients, which are the default uh, that use JAX. And, and then we also have numerical gradients, of course, uh, with, by calling method to point and then the step size that we would prefer. And then, but we can also custom gradients and we can just generate whatever function is uh, is better for us to compute that gradients and call this on call this function using uh, this syntax 
or we can also implement a quantum natural gradient, which is a result, a, very, a quite recent result from Stokes et al. And by calling QNG. So in the end, the idea of tequila is that um, providing as much flexibility as possible. So if something is not um, programmed in the in the library, you can just program by yourself and use it uh, very easily in a simple line. Uh, we also have recently implemented the direct inversion of iterative subspace, that this uh, algorithm, which, uh, which help us to uh, converge into machine precision. And this is very important for chemistry simulations. And, and this, this works um, once we are close to the solution and just kicks in when the maximal gradient achieves the tolerance. So these are, for instance, some benchmark simulations uh, that compare the, di some di the different uh, um, optimizers and then the in particular the stochastic gradient descent with this this uh, optimization so this uh, this will be useful especially for chemistry as i said when you need uh, to press um, huge accuracy in in your result this is also implemented we just have to uh, specify the tolerance and and that's it and then, as I said, we have the numerical and customized gradients that we can just construct and be used uh, with, the, with the gradient based optimizers. And in the end, the idea is that we want to uh, implement uh, the gradients as significantly cheaper uh, we can, with the expectation values, etc. So, as I said, the goal of Tequila is always to simplify the effort of programming. So, everything is already programmed, but in case it's not, you can still use the language, so you can just program it by yourself and call the, your method uh, in a single line. And then just uh, to close with the optimization part, we also have implemented Bayesian optimization, in particular Phoenix and JPyopt. And you can check the, the, the documentation of these, of these methods in their respective um, repositories but uh, as i said we want to even apply even more so if you have any suggestions of other uh, optimization techniques or other uh, uh, gradient based, um, based techniques please let us know and we are we will be more than happy to implement that in the future and then finally we have the noise models uh, the problem with noise models is that every backend um, deals with it in a different way so we needed to find a way to to use that in tequila in a unified form so uh, the same code and the same noise model can be applied to any other uh, backends easily so these are the these are the, the general features that we take the assumptions that we take into account so if noise is present any gate may be affected by noise the second one is that noise affects n qubit gates independent of the noise of n qubit gates, which means that two qubit gates uh, noise is independent of the noise on three qubit gates, for instance. Then noise probabilities are independent on the position of the circuit, so it doesn't matter if the gate is at the beginning or it's at the end, the noise model will be applied exactly the same in these two gates. And then the number of qubits involved in the gate uh, dictates what noise uh, may occur. So C0 gates is not noisier than a control set gates. The noise is exactly the same because the only thing that matters is that it's a two qubit gate noise model. And, and these are the, some of the supporting simulator backgrounds of, of these noise models, bit flips, phase flips, amplitude dumps, phase dumps, uh, symmetric depolarizing, phase amplitude dumps. So these are the very common ones. And you, you can just create your noise model by combining all of them and generate your own noise model. And just by calling noise equal your noise model, uh, Tequila will implement that, that model. So uh, something that to take into account, noise is only supported when sampling, obviously. So you, can, you need to specify in your minimization or in your simulation, the samples of your, of your simulation. And also Tequila supports uh, device noise simulation. So in case that some backend propose a particular noise model that is suitable for this particular chip, you can call it by, by just uh, spelling the name of, of that device. So with this, I conclude all these uh, general features of, of Tequila API, and I will start with more um, examples and particular usage of, of Tequila, starting with the most basic ones, which is creating a quantum circuit. 
So for instance, if we want to create a quantum circuit with a Hadamard gate and a control node gate, we just call the Kila gates Hadamard and specify the target. We can draw the target equal wherever qubit, or we can just put the, the, the qubit uh, number inside of it. And by default, it will, the Kila will understand that that's the target. And then once we have our circuit, we can decide to, to print that circuit or we can draw the circuit. And not only drawing in this particular manner, but we can just use particular drawing uh, of, of some of the backends. For instance, Qiskit pre uh, prefers to draw circuits in a different way. So we can also do that if we prefer this other form. So in the end, since all Qiskit is implemented in, in the Kila, we can use any feature that Qiskit has in the Kila. Another way to, to construct the circuit, uh, if we want to implement Hadamard gates in more than one qubit, we can just specify that in a vector, in a list form. So it will be easier to, or it will be more compact to, to construct this circuit. So this is also supported. Then we have the quantum circuit gates that I implement, uh, I explained before, but let's see uh, some particular examples of them. So we have predefined gates versus Pauli strings and control target definition. So we can either uh, call rotational white gate with angle one and target zero plus the X gate, or we can just um, ask for this Pauli string, in this case, the, uh, the Pauli Y gate, and it will generate exactly the same gate. So the, the, the good thing of having this uh, RP gate is that we can just decide any possible Pauli string. Of course, it's, it's only Y or X or Z, or Z, they are predefined, but if not, you can still use them. And these two ways uh, are exactly the same in delivers exactly the same circuit. Then we have power gates. So for instance, we can call Y gate and specify the power. And and we also have Pauli strings versus rotarization. In this case, both uh, gates are the same. So as I, uh, as I said, you can just specify your Pauli strings uh, as in this case, X and Y, or you can also trotterize your gate using the uh, specifying the generator, in this case, Pauli X and Y. Then with wave function measurements, we can simulate the wave function by just spelling the Q simulate. And in particular, we can specify the backend. If we don't specify the backend, uh, Tequila will find the, the backend that supports a wave function simulation. And this is particularly useful in my opinion when you want to check if your code is working properly or if you don't mess up any part of your circuit, especially with the small simulations. And then we can simulate the circuit, but this can, this time by sampling. So automatically we will obtain the measurements. In this case, uh, we obtain 10 times the state zero, zero. We can print the measurements and, and specify which measurements we would like to print. So if we are only interested in some basis elements, we can also specify that. Or we can just, uh, we can simulate um, the measurements using this uh, other syntax. And then we have the parameterized quantum circuits. Uh, we define the variables. First, we need to define the tequila variable, and then we introduce that variable into our quantum circuit. And then we can simulate the wave function by specifying the value of that simulation. We can also print the circuit uh, um, and draw the circuit with this, uh, this value. And as I will show you, uh, that will be useful when we want to optimize the circuit as a function of these values. So we can also extract the variables. So if we are dealing with uh, tons of variables for some reason, and we don't remember exactly how many uh, variables we have, we can extract these, var these variables easily. Or if we construct the cir our circuit in a loop, so we don't remember exactly how many variables it has, we can also extract these, those variables. And we can also optimize some of these variables and let the others, uh, rem um, and let the others without touching during the minimization process. For instance, if we want to optimize uh, using the layer wise approach. So this very easily implemented in Tequila. And then we have different ways to define a Hamiltonian. So in general, the Hamiltonian will be defined with Pauli strings. So Pauli strings are not the same class as Pauli matrices, but the idea is, is very similar. So we just call Pauli X in this case, or Pauli Y, et cetera. We can use a list to implement this Pauli X gate on different qubits at the same time. And we can also check if uh, the Hamiltonian is Hermitian. If it's not, we can extract the Hermitian part or the anti-Hermitian part. And as I will show you later, uh, we can also obtain the Hamiltonian for a molecule directly. 
and of course, printing that Hamiltonian if necessary. And then how can we create an objective? As I said, the objective is, uh, is the expectation value or a function of the expectation values. So in this case, the objective is just the expectation value of the Hamiltonian of Pauli X gate. So when creating this expectation value, Tequila will ask for the Hamiltonian on the, on the circuit that generates the wave function. And we can compile this expectation value and and obtain a, and 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 once it's a, it's a, it's compiled, we can print it and we can uh, evaluate it more easily uh, by just you know in specifying the value of the of the in this case of the of the variable a. And something very important with objective is they can be differentiated. So if your objective at the end you need to compute something that uh, includes some uh, differential parts of the expectation value, you can do that uh, using the Q, the Q grad. And this is also very important sometimes for, for some of the objectives. So let me show you an example of Oli all together. And these are very complicated objectives and Hamiltonian and, and, and a unitary circuit. So just to show you how can we wrote everything together. So in this case, we define the variable A of our, our unitary operation. When then we construct the, the unitary gate by using this tequila variable. And in this case, we apply the, the, uh, the exponential with, uh, with, with this variable. And then we generate the, the qubit Hamiltonian. In this case, we can generate it from a string. So it's not necessary to specify TQ, Pauli X, TQ, Pauli Y, etc. We can just wrote the, the string and, and tequila will translate that into Pauli matrices. And then we compute the expected value. And as I said, it can be differentiated. So we can compute the, the derivative of this expectation value and construct an objective that is much more sophisticated than just the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. And then in this case, we use phoenix, so we can minimize by specifying the method phoenix and the objectives and all the phoenix configuration that uh, we have decided and the number of maximal iterations, etc., and more things that we can add. And uh, we can also plot the energies and angles of, of this optimization by just uh, spelling energies and dot angles. And this is the result with the points that uh, phoenix visited during the optimization. So let me move and show you a particular chemistry example. And first of all, we will define the molecule. And this molecule in this case is a hydrogen um, lithium. Sorry, I don't remember how to pronounce that, HLLI. And the basis set is uh, STO3G. So first of all, we can just print the molecule. All this information will come directly from your chemistry backend. So you need to install first either uh, open fermion of Psi4 or any other possible backend uh, rated with chemistry that we have installed and implemented in Tequila. So all of this uh, will, all this information come from, part of this information will come from this backend. In particular, this example use the Psi4 backend. And we can print the molecule, uh, molecular orbitals and extract all the information that this backend can provide. And then we will want to obtain the Hamiltonian because we want to run a BQE algorithm, for instance. So the first, if we don't specify the method, uh, Tequila will use the jordan Wigner transformation by just spelling molecule make Hamiltonian. But we can also uh, specify other kinds of transformation, for instance, uh, the Bravikita F1. So just by saying transformation Bravikita F and then making the Hamiltonian. And then we can also select the active spaces to reduce the number of terms of the Hamiltonian. So if I'm not mistaken, the pre this Hamiltonian has like 670 or so number of terms. If we restrict the active orbitals, we will decrease that number and that could be more useful for us if we want to run a simulation with few qubits and not many of them, or if we want to reduce uh, our quantum circuit as much as possible if we use the unitary couple cluster assets after that. So then the, this is uh, the example with the classical methods. In general, we would like to compare the result of our BQE, for instance, with, uh, with the exact result or with the classical method. So we, we can just compute the energy using MP2 or using FCI and in the end and print everything that from, from these classical methods and also extract the, the variables of this and the amplitudes of, of obtained from these molecules. 
And then this is the example of BQE uh, from lithium hydride. Now I remember lithium hydride. And first, as I said, we define the molecule. We uh, we uh, constrain the number of orbitals, the active orbitals, to this one, these two. And we generate the molecule and using this particular basis set and uh, the transformation Bravikita. And then we made the query Hamiltonian, which will be the one that we will optimize in our objective. And then in this case, we can just decide to create a totally general BQE ansatz, or in this case, use the unitary couple cluster ansatz, which is in general used in, in quantum chemistry. So by just calling the function make UCC ansatz. And then we compute the expected value. Uh, as I said to you before, we can define the expectation value and the objective in a more complicated way. In this example, it will be just the, the ground state of, of, this, of this Hamiltonian. And then to compute the reference energies, we can call the classical methods of FCI, for instance, and print the results uh, similarly to as I showed you before. So let me move to the last example, which is a quantum machine learning example, which is based on, on the data reblooding for universal quantum classifier work. These, all these examples are in the tutorial sections and there are many more. So please go ahead and check other ones. Uh, this exam, I use this example because to me it would be very easy to show how can we compute fidelity, which is something that in general is it's used in uh, in, uh, in some quantum machine learning um, algorithms. So first of all, I didn't say that, but we can uh, define the wave function, not only from the quantum circuit, but also from a string or from an array. So we can specify the string, for instance, in this case, the 0, 0 plus 1, 1 state, mm -hmm. or we can just specify the array of, of, this, uh, of this quantum state. And of course, uh, when we uh, define these uh, wave functions manually, uh, remember to normalize it just in case, because in general will not be normalized. Uh, that doesn't happen if you if you define the if you obtain the wave function for the circuit, obviously, because you have applied unitary gates. So these are the three ways that you can use to define your your wave function in, in tequila. And then we have two methods to compute the fidelity. The the first one is the most intuitive one, uh, which is just compute the the overlap between your target state and the wave function of your circuit, for instance. And the second one is the one that uses objectives, which is in the end the core of tequila, as I said. So we construct the, the we compute the, the density matrix of our, of our target state, and we decompose that into Pauli projectors and use these Pauli projectors as objective by just computing the expected value of the quantum circuit, which will generate the the way, one of the wave functions, uh, with respect to the to the. Um, to the density matrix of, of, the, of the target state. And in the end, it's exactly the same, but the second option will be more suitable for tequila, especially if we want to optimize the fidelity for uh, as a function of some variables. This is the model of the example. So we have a model which, uh, um, which is divided into layers, and each layer is uh, it's, uh, some single qubit gates, in particular the general unitary gate, but uh, it's just like the composition of rotational Z, rotational Y, and rotational Z gates. And our the idea of the, this classifier is that uh, we have two classes in this case, and we want to train our classifier to achieve one state or another. And this is a very general uh, way of thinking about quantum classification, and there are many other works that do the same. Uh, the difference with others is that we introduce the data, or in this case, the, the value of, of uh, that we want to classify into the quantum circuit manually, and we apply that in all layers. So in the end, the cost function, as in any other works, is the, the overlap uh, between your target state and the circuit state wave function, which depend on the variational parameters that we have to optimize. So first of all, we need to define the target state wave function. And in this case, uh, I decided to, to, to define it from an array. So we have the state uh, zero when the class is zero and the state one when the class is one. And of course we can generate any other possible wave functions. So it, this is just an example. And then we construct the quantum classifier. And in this case, since it's organized by layers, uh, we, it will be useful to just construct a for loop that, uh, that adds as many layers as, as we require. 
In this case, as I said, uh, this model, this ANSAT uh, contains rotational Y gates that includes the, the value of the point to be classified plus a parameter that will be optimized later in the minimization part of it. And then we have the loss function. First of all, using the fidelity function that I just described before. So it will take as an input the wave function, the target wave function, and it will compute the and the compose into projector the, the density matrix. And then we have the objective expectation value with the quantum circuit that will be our quantum classifier and the target uh, and the target um, density matrix. And with that, we can construct any possible cost function. In this case, it's a very simple one because it's just the sum of all infidelities, but we can construct a more sophisticated one. And as I said, we can differ even differentiate this loss function if necessary. So we can do whatever we prefer with these objectives. And uh, this is the result, this is the code for the training part. So here uh, we have this, uh, we will use the points inside and outside of a circle for classification. And we generate the training set using a function that I didn't wrote here, but just delivers the points of inside and outside of a circle and levels them. And then we generate the variables uh, in this, uh, the kilo variables. In this case, I wanted to call them theta, th. We can decide any other name. And, and then we initialize these variables at random in this case. This is not very useful in general for variational quantum algorithms, as many of you may know, because the Baron Plateau problem. But we can just decide if we can start at random of a particular point. And then we, we decide the, the optimization parameters. In this case, I will use a, a numerical gradient, and I will use RMS propagation method. And, and as I said, the cost function is, is the objective and is the function that I just presented before that uses the data, the labels, and the parameters. And then we can just test, but we can generate the test by minimizing that objective. And uh, this is the result. So we can print the, the loss, which is the, the, the energy of this minimization. And we can plot the energies and angles, and this is the result. So it's very easy to just plot it uh, uh, with the kilo because you, you have a, a first idea of what's going on in your minimization. Of course, after that, you can just use your data for generating other kinds of plots. But this is more or less uh, the result that we will obtain with, with the kilo. And then we run the test. In this case, this uh, this um, not so related with the kilo. So in this case, the, the test is 1,000 points. And we generate the quantum circuit uh, with the parameters of random parameters to, from, generated for the test. We compute the wave function. And in this case, this is the important line here, the wave function QC equal TQ simulate. Uh, here, we specify that the variables of the quantum circuit of the quantum classifier are the results of the test. So by just spelling test.angles, we automatically substitute all the values of, of our quantum circuit by, by the, value and the, value and the values of the variables. And with that, we generate all, all, all the test points and we check if they are correct or not, and this is the result. So this is just an example of a very simple algorithm that can be used for quantum classification. Of course, there are many more, and uh, we are working in new tutorials that implement other kinds of algorithms precisely, because we believe that this is the way to understand how, not only how tequila works, but also to prove uh, and, um, the plasticity of tequila, how can it will, uh, and the versatility of it, and how can it be applied to any, you know, to any, to many different, um, problems. And these are the, pro the current projects that use Tequila. These are more sophisticated ones. So the a basis set free approach for BQE, employing per natural orbitals. All these, all, all these works have uh, an example code, at least. The metavariational quantum eigen solver, and also the computerized design of, of quantum optical hardware. So these are more sophisticated codes that use Tequila. And it could be used as a, as a proof, as I said, that the versatility of this language uh, that can be used for state of the art and to developing new algorithms. And we are currently working in, in, in adding more and more backends, in particular Orchestra, Kibo, PyQuest, and Intel QS. I believe Kibo is, uh, if it's not uh, ready, it's almost ready, as well as Orchestra, but Jacob can, can say more about that. But I believe they are almost ready. 
And then we are, would also like to work with new libraries to implement the Mythic and TensorFlow in particular, but we are open to any suggestions, comments, and recommendations. And also, if you want to be part of Tequila, uh, let us know because we are we want to generate an open quantum, uh, an open source quantum language developed by academia for academia and, and beyond. So in the end, uh, the, the important thing of this language is that everybody participates on them and everybody is uh, willing to add more and more features. So it can be really useful. Uh, the goal of Tequila, as I said at the beginning, is to provide a general framework uh, that can be used to benchmark and to test any possible quantum algorithm. So you don't have to re rely on particular backends or that can become obsolete or maybe they or maybe they are not useful for you. So for instance, I some years ago I did a, a simulation and I needed to, to compare the, the results in the IBM computer and the Rigetti computer and I have to wrote two different uh, programs to exactly wrote uh, to exactly run exactly the same algorithm so if i had the kill at that time it would it had be it will be much easy in the sense that i just wrote one algorithm and then i call backend equal qiskit or backend equal pyquil and i will obtain the, the corresponding uh, simulation of these particular backends. So this is the, the idea of and behind tequila. So we want just to simplify the efforts for theoreticians as us and, and try to take into account as many possible new libraries and, and codes and packages that helps in quantum simulation. So for instance, uh, I don't remember who you said that, but uh, that has been working in tensor networks uh, simulations. That will be very useful too, to mix that with Tequila at some point. So you can use Tequila also to uh, perform tensor network simulations or to simulate your circuit with tensor networks. So you can compute some, some values, uh, interesting values here. So please let us know any suggestion and thank you for your attention and for all the developers of Tequila. So in the end, the, the very big two developers were Jacob and Sumner and the rest of us, we contribute in some of the, of the features of Tequila. And I hope that this list just grows in the future. So Tequila.2.0 can include more and more people, all the community if possible. So thank you and please let me know any questions and I will try to answer them. Thank you very much, Alba. We have uh, time for questions. I also have seen that uh, Jacob answered the symbolic backend uh, question on chat. Uh, so uh, now we have open discussion. I have a question, Alba. Um, so uh, you you showed um, when you were discussing the or um, showing the API that there are classical optimizers. And you kind of alluded to quantum circuit optimization at one point, um, but I'm curious whether the API like uh, might support um, additional, like an additional stage for um, uh, quantum circuit optimization, either through I, I don't know if like you know for instance Qiskit has their optimization levels. I don't know if it's e if it's possible to pass those through when you're compiling the quantum circuit, but there's also, you know, like projects like Pi, Pi ZX, which will, you know, kind of work outside of the embedded compilation loop of the packages themselves. So I'm curious, like, I, I'm a big proponent of Pi ZX. I think like it's a, you know, um, it works quite well and it would be neat, you know, especially for looking to run on different hardware back backends. So I'm just wondering where that fits into maybe Tequila 2.0. Uh, thanks for your question, and I'm really excited of uh, of exit calculus. To be honest, so uh, we are very interested on that. And currently, as far as I know, I at least in the open version, uh, they are not supported. So you are talking about compilation, right? So how to simplify the circuit first before the 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 real simulation or or, or running the the algorithm, or to map your circuit into a particular topology. Uh, we don't have that yet implemented, but it's part of the list of things that we want to include, definitely. So yeah, yeah, that will be very useful. And that's one of the big points, in my opinion, that uh, that Tequila has to implement at some point, because that's in the end, uh, the, a very, very practical thing that we will need. So how to map our circuit in a particular topology 
And also if we can simplify that circuit, especially for NISC simulations. So we want as, as uh, lower the gate depth as possible. So yeah, there are many techniques that can be very useful. And yeah, we want to do that. So it's part of the list of things, but it's not supported yet. Great, thank you. Uh, hey, Alba. Uh, Hi. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. Uh, could you elaborate on how we could incorporate tensor networks with tequila? Well, that's that's the thing. So we would like to, but uh, we will need to discuss that with someone that works with that, those libraries first. So I can think about, for instance, uh, I believe that it could be a model after you simulate your circuit. You just uh, map your, so sorry, you just call this um, tensor network method, for instance, to simulate that circuit with tensor networks specifying, I don't know, bone dimension, for instance. And I can think about that because I, in the end, Tequila is organized in a way that you can just add more modules and you don't touch the main code. In the end, the core of Tequila is the objective. So you can add whatever you want uh, uh, around it and just call it at any time. So for instance, I can just um, create the circuit, the quantum circuit. I can call the wave function module to obtain the, mod the, the wave function, or I can just call um, some tensor network module that uh, will deliver the, the, the matrix product states, for instance, of that, of that wave function. So that could be another way to think about it. But I believe that it will be better to discuss that with someone that is familiar with, uh, with these libraries of tensor networks. But yeah, I, will, I believe that it will not be so difficult because in the end, you can just call you know, this extra library and, and that's it. And you just have to, to introduce that in the, in the source code of Tequila. And yeah, in the end, yeah, I don't think it will be very difficult. And maybe we can think about more sophisticated things. I, I don't know, like a full different module with a tensor network simulation maybe well, it depends on which applications are you thinking about, but yeah, I think that we can try many things. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because uh, for my master thesis, I'm uh, simulating quantum circuits uh, using tensor networks and matrix product states. So mm -hmm. Maybe I'll uh, write to you later and then we can talk about it. Yeah, let's stay in touch and yeah, we can try to figure out how to do that. But yeah, yeah I believe that in the end, the tequila core uh, will not be affected by anything that we add on mm -hmm. top of that. So that's the, the good thing of it. So the skeleton is the same. The only thing that in this option part, you may also add uh, MPS simulation of your circuit. Right. Yeah, thank you. And maybe you can even uh, use the, the optimization methods, the classical ones to, I don't know, to find uh, some of these, uh, some of the coefficients of the, your matrix product state or optimize on top of that, or I don't know. So in the end, you have all the optimization methods here. So you can also take advantage of them that they are around, you know, they are already right. around there, you can call them, etc. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, maybe a comment on that, like um, if you're, for example, developing like tensor network codes, um, what's like, as soon as like your backend, which you are developing, which uses tensor networks, if this understands like quantum circuits, and it, it sounded a little bit to me, like it does, if you say you are simulating quantum circuits, then this can be more or less plugged into Tequila the same way as we plug in, for example, the QLAX simulator. And this means then as soon as you like made this connection, you can use all the algorithms that have been developed using Tequila before. It's so like the whole deal of like, if you have multiple expectation values and you make an objective function out of them and then you sample them and then you need gradients from them. This is all independent of the actual tensor network simulation of the individual yeah. circuits. And as soon mm -hmm. as you like connected it, you have like access to all those algorithms to do like benchmarks or like tests, like how far can your backend go? Right. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, and Jacob also answered some questions in the chat. So thanks for that as well. He's the master of tequila, basically, so. <laughs> Sorry. Any other questions for Alba or Jacob? I guess I have one small question about the user interface. Um, is it, 
is it pretty straightforward to for the user to to easily define their own onsets um, yeah. including in onsets where you have i mean it's, it seems like most um packages that i've seen and i haven't looked that much but um you know it kind of assumes that all rotation gates are supposed to be parameterized by the optimizer but there's cases where you know i only want some some percentage of the rotations to be parameterized is that easy to specify or is there okay yeah let me show you a particular example for instance uh for chemistry we have already implemented the unitary couple cluster answers so you don't have to care about that so just call UCC and that's it, and the ansatz is automatically uh, generated. And then for you know more manual ansatz, uh, this is the example of this example, for instance. So here, I decided to uh, to construct rotational y with the whatever values. In this case, one parameterized value. But of course, uh, this x val is something fixed that it comes in, the, in my definition of, of the quantum circuit. I can just erase this parameter here and just fix x val parameter. And not only that, but the tequila also allows, and this is one of the one of the, the features that includes the minimization part, uh, to optimize only a few variables, which means that I fix some of them, and then I run my optimization as a function of some others. This is, uh, for instance, can be used for the layer-wise uh, um, minimization that is using some variational quantum algorithms that you fix the parameters of one of all the layers except one and you optimize on top of that and then you move to the next layer and you keep the the result of the previous one and optimize the next one and so on and so forth you can do that with tequila easily you just have to specify which variables would you like to optimize and the others if you prefer to fix a value of them or if you don't fix any value they will be initialized at random by default so this is also one feature in i believe it's in here, sorry, too many slides. Here, in variables, in additional keywords, variables, the list of variables that you want to optimize. Mm -hmm. By default will be all of them. And then initial values, you have to specify which values. In general, you can use extract variables and, and that's it, and you will have all of them. And then initialize a random or a particular value. Or you can just decide uh, initial values and the values that you want to optimize, if you have a specified before the variables. But then, yeah, and then in the in the quantum gates definition, which I believe is here, yeah, these all the quantum gates that you have. Some of them are parameterized, other are not. For instance, the x, y, and z are not parameterized. They can be parameterized if you compute the power of them. So the power could be a parameter if you wish but it's not necessarily. So you can just mix whatever you prefer. There are some examples in the tutorials, I believe. So you can check that there. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, if not, let's thank Alba again for the excellent talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexi. And thank you oh. everyone for your attention. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to also um, introduce uh, Meritus Khan, who I see joined us. He's also from Stanford uh, Quantum. He's a colleague of Jeremiah. So welcome, Merit. Uh, and we have some time for general discussion. Um, and uh, I've seen in the RSVPs, uh, we, we ask folks to um, uh, either propose lightning talks or ask for lightning talks. And uh, I think folks who propose some of the lightning talks uh, actually are not here, but uh, I think Rishi asked uh, uh, if somebody can teach us um, ZX calculus, if I'm correct. And uh, I guess we need to uh, bring Alex uh, back from Oxford with uh, 101, right? I think this was the uh, topic we uh, discussed, right? But we need to have some. Um, Kind of one-on-one -on -one level tutorials. So if you guys are interested, I think it's uh, it's probably a good idea to kind of invite um, invite uh, some of the speakers back and teach us the basics. Which brings me to another question. I think there are several folks here uh, who are looking to enter the field, and I received requests from uh, some of the pretty senior software engineers in the Bay Area, whom I knew as colleagues in various startups, and some you know, folks kind of really 
uh, advanced in, for instance, databases, and they actually uh, educate themselves in, in quantum computing. And so I just wanted to ask uh, Amir, maybe uh, Sasha, uh, so you guys are looking to move into this field. What are the um, recommendations? What are the, some starting points? Do you have some uh, ideas uh, how can somebody, you know, with general science background, maybe working in uh, software engineering right now, what's what are the good ways to move to kind of familiarize themselves with this field uh and maybe kind of like eventually i think folks really want to get a job in this field um if anybody has an idea because you know i i receive actually specific requests for advice what would you advise yeah i have a quick addition to that uh because i prepared some questions for the discussion and uh, also can you focus on like everyone here with like phds and in the field and also people who don't have PhDs in the field focus on the benefits of and the necessity of a PhD. Well, I may add in the in this, uh, I mean, PhD versus not PhD. Um, I believe that things have, has changed a lot in the last years, in a sense that when when I started my PhD, for instance, um, who was working in quantum computing. I mean, were people that were working in quantum information for the last years, basically. It was quite a small subfield in physics and, and quantum computing in particular. And But uh, with all this creation of these companies and, and the realization that, yeah, quantum computer may exist and may be useful, and many, many jobs have appeared. And now we need not only theoreticians that, you know, that think about the complexity of, of the algorithms or, or designing the, the new ones, et cetera, but we need many engineers, many, to construct the device, because if not, it doesn't make sense to even think about the algorithms, but also many software engineers. So, and the, the Kila is one of the, of the examples and many other languages in the end. So there is a lot of jobs that doesn't require a PhD, but rather a huge experience with Python, for instance, or with other tools to really implement these quantum languages, because that will be the only way that it will be useful for us, uh, especially in this NISC era, because we have the one. So experimentally, we have a quantum computer, which is, you know, a device, an experimental device. We want to control that. And we need a good interface between our computer and our hardware. So we need to engineer that. And especially if the, the coherence times in the quantum computers are so short, uh, we need to you know, perform all of the operations as fast as possible. And for that, I believe that uh, there is plenty of jobs and you can check easily in many of the startups and companies that doesn't require a PhD, but rather maybe experience in quantum computing or not even that, like experience in other fields. And, and then this from one side, but also from other sides, uh, even if you have a PhD or not, um, we, only, we also need people from different backgrounds, not only physics. We need people for chemistry, for instance, to tell us what are the problems in chemistry, people from finance that tell us what are the problems in finance, etc. Because in the end, we are developing a tool that can be used for solving many problems, but we need to know which problems we want to solve. So that's why maybe people that doesn't have a PhD is also useful, of course, because if they have experience in, I don't know, finance, for instance, they can provide this, this information to us and we can work together to find the, the proper algorithm, for instance. Yeah, so uh, a quick follow up on that. So we, we see that trend in the industry, right? The, in like mo most emerging technologies, uh, pe usually like uh, people with PhDs drive the industry until there's like a, a point where you need more engineers, especially software engineers that don't necessarily do research in that field or have that like breadth of knowledge, but can do like the hard tasks of like coding that in or like making the like circuit connections that in, in, in the hardware, right? But um, the, the question is here, I think like right now, I, what I'm trying to ask is, do you think that people can train themselves and do research in the field, like um, doing, like designing actual quantum algorithms, not like the hard, hard task jobs, but as like as researchers? Do you think people can join the field as research researchers without a PhD? Yeah, um, I believe it's possible. Yeah, in general, the only problem that I I can see, of course, I have a PhD, so I'm biased. Okay, <laughs> so uh, in the in this matter, but. 
the only problem that I see, because I, I also suffer from that, is there is a lot of noise in the field. And that happens all the time with all fields. So sometimes it's difficult to tackle what are the real problems or if what you are doing is as actually useful or not. And for that, it's really useful to talk with other people uh, that provides uh, feedback about your idea and what about what you are doing. And this is very difficult to do if you are you know, alone in your home and you are not part of an organization or, or, a, or a university or a company. But to be honest, there are many, many ways to get in touch with other researchers nowadays, for instance, these kind of talks and, uh, and events and many others. So I believe that you can really start by your own. And then at some point, of course, you will have to make some contact with other people, but you can, you have, you have, I believe, all the tools to start. And then, of course, just contact uh, other guys and ask questions like, yeah, I had this idea. Do you think this has sense, et cetera, or just discuss that in some panel discussions like this one. So it's easy to start by your own. And, but yet at some point, you should take some contact with other people and other researchers if you want to do something. Because it's really difficult that you just have a, an idea that works because it may be worse in your head, but it's, or maybe someone has developed that before and that happens all the time. So especially with this quantum information and quantum computing, many people have worked in this field for years. And there are many papers that are hidden and you just discover these papers like you have a super cl uh, clever idea and then some guy in the 90s just developed exactly the same. And it's difficult to keep track of that. Only the all guys in the field know this kind of papers. So that's why it's also useful to, to make some contacts. Okay, so from what I understand, you're saying that the, uh, the, co the collaboration uh, between researchers is necessary. It, it, it's not, it doesn't matter what, whether you have a PhD or not, but you, you, it's good to be a part of an organization or, a, or an academic institution. Can we do a quick survey here on how many people watching this right now are have PhDs? If you do have one, can you uh, put a plus one to the chat? Obviously, Alba has one, but um, I, it would be nice to have like a, um, see how many people have, have PhDs and watching this interested in quantum computing. Um, if I could add a few comments, um, I totally agree with everything Alba said, but um, so I, I'm, I have a position at Intel and I should say there are some companies, including Intel, that still have a very strong bias towards PhDs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's not <clears throat> obviously not universally true. I know people at Rigetti um, who don't have PhDs, same with Zapata, uh, but I don't want you to get the, the, the wrong impression that there are some uh, companies that are a bit slow to adopt this, but I think that should change pretty soon. Because as Alba said, we need so many workers um, to do all, all the work. Yeah, I mean, as, as for my background, I'm currently working part-time with QCWare and I, I am a master's student at Stanford, right? So uh, we see we see this trend changing, uh, but obviously there are like different perks of having a PhD and um, um, I, I'm not like biased against a PhD. I, I would like to get one as well. I'm just like trying to, um, see the, understand the field and make other people understand. Um, another question that I have, and this is also open to everyone, um, is about the barriers to quantum simulation. So, um, obviously Tequila is backend or hardware agnostic. It's not just a simulation tool. It can run on real hardware, but, um, what are the, what are the barriers to quantum simulation when we're trying to understand real quantum systems and do you think there will be a point where the, sim the simulations will no longer be re relevant will reach a point in hardware where the hardware will be um we won't be able to uh simulate that hardware well that's theoretically that's 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 possible but when do you think that will happen and again this is open to everyone so if anyone wants to join in Well, uh, sorry to answer again. Um, yeah, I mean, if you think, so you mean classical simulation of quantum algorithms? Yeah, classical. The, I mean, no. you know, yes. it's exponentially hard. So at some point it will not be possible at all. Mm -hmm. Although um, if you have um, low entanglement, you can do 
efficient simulations with tensor network techniques, for instance. So in the end, that's to me one of the important points of quantum computing, any algorithm, any application, you need to check if the amount of entanglement is high or not. Because if, if it's not, you don't need a quantum computer. You can do everything classically. So that's on one side. Uh, on the other side, um, we, all, we don't only have quantum, digital quantum computers. We, cannot, we also have quantum simulators like called atoms, et cetera. And, and you can do practical stuff with that. The problem with these ones is they are not universal. So they are only useful for particular problems or you can also have quantum annealing. So there are other techniques besides digital quantum computation that can be useful for simulating, simulating many things. And, but yeah, in the end, um, what we do as a, a theoretically, let's say when you develop an algorithm, you just develop a proof of concept uh, algorithm. You run that with 14 qubits or so, something that your laptop can stand. And what uh, you should check is theoretically if there is some advantage, or at least even if the result is heuristic as the variational algorithms, if the scaling is exponential. Because if it's exponential and your and your algorithm is working with a few qubits, of course, you will know that it will continue working with more probably, but still you can't simulate that anymore. And that's one of the quantum supremacy and the supremacy paper from Google was precisely that they do their rest to simulate uh, the result with a classical computer, but at some point it was not possible anymore because the amount of entanglement was too high. Yeah. So if we did put a time frame to that, uh, when when do you, when and when does everyone think that simulation? But we, we won't be able to like. Yes, for like low entanglement systems, we can efficiently simulate. But there will be a point where like the algorithms that are useful to the real world uh, will not be. We, we won't be able to simulate them. When do you think that's gonna happen? If you if you were to take a guess, if you had to like say like a month. When do you think that's going to happen? I'm not asking about like quantum supremacy in some sense, but like just like we, we, we you, you, your simulations won't be like useful or relevant anymore. That we have to stick to using hardware, even if you're not doing useful things, but we will have to stick the hardware to do research. But that's the definition of quantum supremacy precisely when you cannot simulate that with a classical computer, even if it's something that is not useful at all. But you know, yeah. Um, I don't know because we are currently in this area because now the chips are 50 qubits or so still you need to control these qubits if you have the co much the coherence uh, the entanglement is not high so you can again simulate that officially classically but uh, I would say that in the following years I mean this year the next one and so I believe that yeah we will start seeing some results that cannot be simulated with a classical computer I don't believe that there will be probably not super useful results because it's still, you know, small things and see things that maybe can be simulated with a quantum simulator. But we will still, I believe that in the next two years, we will see something in this direction. But it still will depend on the on the hardware side. So we can develop many clever algorithms that take advantage of noise and everything and solves many problems. But if the device is not well designed, nothing will work. So yeah, so that's why we need so many people in the end, so. Yeah, it's an exciting field to be in. Um, also, I wanna, I wanna talk about like um, the landscape in Europe for a bit. Um, so th this article just came out, not, uh, I wanna share it with everyone, uh, the link. And there are, there is a, so United States, I think started uh, they had more startups at the beginning, but now like Europe is uh, emerging with more projects and startups. And as as a as a so now you're in Toronto, but right if, if I'm not mistaken, but you you are from the um, you're yeah, from Bar I am from Barcelona. Yeah. So uh, I'm checking this graph, and there are some. So what is this landscape? Is universities or also companies? Startups. Startups. So yeah. it's at least in Spain, it's not correct because the Spanish National Research Council is not a startup, it's a national institute. And the Institute okay. of Photonic Science is the same and Barcelona Cubic is not even an institute, it's just a, it's a Twitter and LinkedIn account that 
tweets about no news about uh, quantum information in general. So uh, what I can say is the in Europe, the situation is the following. We have the quantum flagship, which is a lot of money that the European Union has put in quantum technologies in general, and that has this, several, uh, several parts. Quantum simulation, quantum computation, quantum com um, communication, and quantum sensing and metrology, and also by basic science. So we have to, you know, uh, split the different parts of this money. And in quantum computing, and I believe that Rishi, you were the ones that uh, is in Chalmers, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, probably you can tell more about that. But there is there are different projects in the quantum computing part. One of those is Open Supercube, which I believe is the one that probably you're working on, or I don't know. Which is the they they are constructing a quantum uh, superconducting quantum circuit in Chalmers. But there is a collaboration of many people in Europe. But this, from the uh, you know, from the governmental point of view, but there are many new startups. There is one IQM, for instance, that is in Finland and Munich, and in Barcelona you have Kilimanjaro, which is another startup, uh, and also uh, Multiverse Computing, which is a startup that focuses on software, quantum software for finance, and and then uh, not only that. So you. You should also think about not only about the you know software computers or who is building the computer, also who is developing the methods and the devices to build a computer. And in Europe, you have Blue Force, which is which is a huge company for uh, creating the uh, dilution refrigerators, use it for um, superconducting uh, circuits. So these are basically the ones that are uh, selling uh, the, the, all these refrigerators to absolutely everybody, including big companies like Google, IBM, etc. So and they they are from Finland, fin, fin, Finland. Sorry. So many. Uh, so some of these enabling technology um, parties are in Europe. Some of them. Um, and yeah, new startups are are emerging. But I, I still think that the problem in Europe is that. Uh, we don't have the tradition uh, like in America of developing all these uh, startups. And so people prefer to stay in academia in general. But probably this is starts to change because some people leave academia because they are tired of other things or because it's not for them anymore. But now maybe they have the opportunity to continue their work and their research in a startup. So there, I believe that there are there are some opportunities in Europe and more and emerging. So we will see. It's kind of a race. So between America, now Europe, and of course China, and and also Japan, and also in in, uh, in Australia. So there are many many parties here. And in the end, is we will see who builds the quantum computer first and who and who develop the killer app. You know. But yeah, I believe that now there are opportunities around the globe in general, uh, which is very nice. So you. Practically, you can select wherever continent you want to live and try to find a quantum startup there. Yeah, that's great to hear. Alba, uh, so when you were saying about a, like a clarification on something that you were saying, when you say the amount of entanglement grows exponentially, the is it like a measure that you're referring to? Or so I keep coming across this, but. Uh, how do you like, I know the entanglement doesn't yeah. grow exponentially. <laughs> sorry, if I, uh, sorry if I said that. Uh, I was mentioning that the, um, the simulation will grow exponentially. Of course, right. your wave function will grow exponentially. Mm -hmm. The entanglement grows with the, well, it depends what, what you are simulating. But uh, with random circuits, I believe it grows linearly. Uh, but I'm not super sure about that. With If you simulate condensed matter experiments, et cetera, it, it, uh, it grows with the area law. So right. it depends. But yeah, the point is that at some point, if the entanglement is not low, uh, you can simulate everything classically yeah, with this. Yeah. yeah, so, but when you say entanglement is low, is it like uh, one human entropy of the entanglement or like, are you? Are I'm you always thinking about entropy between, you know, half of the system versus the other, which is the typical it's measure. But deep. there is, as far as I know, there is no particular bound, of course. Like, yeah, if you have more than this, you cannot do that any, uh, anymore. It's more like uh, if you don't have, so when you approximate everything with that some networks, mm -hmm. you need to select your bond dimension, which is related with your Smith rank. Yeah. So it, that will depend. So if, you know, if your computer is super powerful, you can still simulate highly entangled states. You just keep the bond dimension high and that's it. Mm -hmm. So at some point, if you want to cut that, 
you, you need to take into account that you are cutting uh, a lot of entanglement of your system probably if it doesn't have much it's okay but if right. it has if yeah. you suspect that there is much it's not so okay but yeah, yeah as far as i know there is no you know particular bound like more than this you cannot do that of course not mm -hmm. it depends on your yeah. computer but efficient in the sense that you can approximate something that is close to the reality mm -hmm. yeah and uh, and another comment is back to the phd or no phd thing uh like this this is open to all like do people here think that there's a benefit of having an industry experience before doing their phd or uh, uh like directly jumping into phd and then exploring industry or academia or whatever so could someone who's experienced or like who knows more about this comment on this it's like i don't have like industrial experience but like at least like my scientific path was not super straight mm -hmm. so i would say there's no general answer to this if you have industrial experience before your phd this for sure has advantages but if you jump into your phd directly this also has advantages because then you're like finished earlier and those right. things it really depends on like you like if you have an opportunity to have like industry experience and you you like that work that you're doing there then you should do it but you should not force yourself to do something like this in order to have some possible advantage because then usually this goes wrong like if right. you're if you're yeah. not enjoying it, it yeah of course break. of course but uh, the question is if you have like both options that you have an option to go to the industry you have an option to go to the academia then uh, uh, how would how would one go about weighing them uh, both are interesting work let's say i think if you go to industry before like some of my colleagues worked like an in industry a year or mm -hmm. something and then they decided they want to do a phd and this wasn't a disadvantage for them like also like when they applied here uh in toronto like this was more like you have some additional experience right. if you have been in industry like for 10 years people might get skeptical um yeah. but in principle like i think that's fine okay. i mean in general to the phd question from the four like, I think it's actually like, if you want to do science, you should get a PhD. There's no way around it. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can do things without a PhD, but then you always have to be the one who really sticks out. Yeah, yeah. Because otherwise you will be the one who like, if you like apply somewhere, like they get so many like applications. And this is like the first thing, like how they filter it out. And if you don't like have like, a, I mean, you can be like, if you have like a super good reputation or something like, then it's fine but like if people don't know you like and yeah, you don't have a phd they will just this will be the first filter criteria mm -hmm. and these other qualities that you might bring they won't even see yeah there's also that... like if you want to do research there's a lot of like things you can apply for independent grants like uh you can apply like being like uh like after your fund. phds like for postdoc grants like those things they all require a phd so like all these opportunities you will not have if you don't have it like at least right. in the European system. And I think it's the same in the American one. So like you have a huge disadvantage if you don't, if you don't have it. But this is really just like, if you wanna do research, mm -hmm. if you wanna work in science and technology, that might be different actually. But if you really like, if your goal is to do independent research at some point, you need to get a PhD sooner or later. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I mean yeah. it's also it's a good like thing because like if you do your phd soon like and then you maybe figure out that you don't like academic research at all and that it's not like how you thought it was then it's better like to make that experience like earlier and then <laughs> you can still go to industry like it's it's not that they say oh now you have a phd like no way we're gonna hire you it's more like <laughs> it's, it's usually an advantage right yeah. okay I can give you guys maybe a little unusual perspective. Uh, it took me 15 years to finish my PhD, right? Uh, my PhD is in computer science. Uh, and um, and actually, I think I was the first uh, graduate student who downloaded a significant chunk of Twitter. So I was the first receiver of the Twitter streaming API. And that is kind of my small claim to fame that I discovered Justin Bieber when nobody knew who he was. Uh, so that's a little bit different, right? And so my, my undergrad was in physics. So kind of, you know, uh, what, what I would say, you know, and then basically I joined startups, right? So the first time I kind of lapsed in science when I joined the 2000 uh, computer uh, kind of, you know, internet boom. And then, you know, the moment I finished my PhD, uh, I actually went to Silicon Valley. 
and join startups. So, so I think really, I think you know, it's kind of so I kind of straddle academia and, and industry, and I kind of oscillated. And finally, the solution was kind of ended when I ended up here, right? Uh, and so I think it's and I'm pretty unusual in the sense that I finished my. It took me 15 years to finish my PhD, and I finished it. Most people who, work, who go to startups never do. So you know, and the fourth function was you know my first child was going to be born, and I kind of suddenly realized it's much better to be a dad in a small university town than in the big city. So I actually kind of went to to Dartmouth to be a kind of uh, to work with my regional advisor. So my my, my degree is from Japan, but my committee member was at Dartmouth and he, um, uh, George Sabenka, he, uh, you know, basically had a lot of um, uh, grants for, for doing this kind of research, right? So, so I think it really change, it really depends on what you're gonna do, right? Uh, uh, so I thought PhD is very important in order to collaborate with academia. I never wanted to make an academic career. So people thought they do it like, you're too old already. Like, you know, you have to be like, you know, if you don't make it before 30, you know, you will not have, uh, uh, kind of traditional kind of you know stellar career track in 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 universities right but what I think what really changes especially uh, with um, um, kind of startup culture right that a lot of work is done in industry so I think what what what's really interesting for me in this kind of conversations context is we see these two forces collide right and so and I think quantum field is a bit delayed compared to traditional computer science because if you look at computer science you know it started in the 50s and 60s there was no computers right so who joined it there were people from linguistics math and physics people with a traditional academic background right and they all fused together and suddenly in general computer science now there's a feeling that like you're wasting your time if you do a phd because instead of you know spending five years on a phd you should have joined google in the year 2000 you now would be, would be a gazillionaire and you can study anything at your leisure right uh, or you can do a startup so the kind of the wisdom in the silicon valley shifted to kind of vice for action you know go in and do something first figure it out right and so so in that sense i'm a big proponent that it's really useful to take a break between for instance masters and phd right like i would not i would not unless you really want to be uh, a professor in a top school, right? Then you really, and I see a lot of folks like this, right? So I think, we, and, and still, regardless even of all the money which is kind of floating around the, the field, we have folks like this, even in deep learning, machine learning, who refuse to join a startup and advanced science. So I think it's really, what is kind of, what is your goal? But if you, if, if you really want to change the world on a big scale for industry, I think you should really take a break and at least a year or two in turn, we see a lot of people interning. Then there are in the US, uh, this co-op system in some places. And I know in Canada, there are like, you know, so Waterloo, I think is very famous for this and stuff like that. So a lot of these folks went to Amazon, for instance, right? Amazon hired a bunch of uh, uh, Waterloo graduates because they had this experience. And in the US is Drexel, Drexel University, you know, encourages people to take breaks. So I, I would really say it's, it's very interesting, right? It's, it's really interesting how this field evolves. And, and, and I think we have kind of, academic track people here, we have industry track people, and I'd like to see more of both and kind of, we'll see what happens going forward. But, but I think more and more people need industry experience because you need to integrate as the software gets into the world, more and more people use it. You get more and more people without PhDs who, who need help, right? And so, so I think it's really incumbent on everybody here to kind of figure out how do we educate people? Uh, how do we do one-on-one -on -one kind of level courses? How do we do tutorials? No, it's not really all about uh, pushing the envelope how do we educate most people you kind of basic get them up to speed how and you know obviously coding is fun because like something like tequila i can check it out on github and play with it right like this is the beauty of this so that's kind of some thoughts i had yeah my thoughts align more with your with your direction alexis yeah it's just one thing um uh, taking Keep in mind the different mentality in that sense between America and Europe, because that in America can work. But for instance, this oscillation taking 50 years for having a PhD, etc. In Europe, in many universities, you have to achieve your PhD in four or five years, or you are done. You know, so you need to do that because you are forced to. So it depends on the model. So just if you if you take that in mind and it's like okay, it's fine, but I will do that in America, which is not a problem. So go ahead and taking a year to think about your future and explore other possibilities. I believe it's always nice and good. 
And if you want to come back to academia, the only thing that you should also think is you need to continue publishing somehow because it's the way to, that you show that you have done something, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. But still, one year, it's more than OK for, for achieving other things. And as, as, as Jacob said, I mean, sometimes you start something and you just realize that it's not for you, which is perfect because you don't lose your time and you just move to another thing. And that's that's uh, very OK. And now with quantum computing, which is super interesting, is that in all these new startups and also big companies, you are actually doing research some sometimes. So it's like being in academia, but you're not in academia. So you just have to keep in mind that at some point the things can change completely. Like, you know, your boss tell you, okay, now you have to work in this algorithm and that's it. Uh, but in general, it's not what is happening because in the end, your boss will be probably a guy who left academia. So his background or her background was academia too. So, so that's what's going on in quantum computing at the moment. So it's not so different from academia because all these people that is funding new startups are people that are from academia, basically. So that's why their mentality is academia. And that's why what uh, they were saying before about the uh, Intel, et cetera, they have this bias by PhD because in the end who hires you is a guy from academia. So he, it, he or she has this bias too. So, but it's something that it will change with time, I'm sure. So. So yeah, taking a year for it, and that's why the internships exist in the end. So you have this opportunity to explore other paths, which is always good. Yeah, but yeah. also these internships, like they usually ask the big research groups if their PhDs wanna do internships. And then I think there was more like the phenomenon that they really didn't have like enough people, like the pool was not large enough to fish from, so they opened it up. But this will not stay like this. It's also not that I that I like that it will not stay like this or something. It's just I, I think that's a reality. Like there will be like more people doing PhDs in that direction, and then you will those are your competitors. Right. So um if you don't do one, you have an, a disadvantage if you want. It's it's not that I'm in favor of the system, but um I think this is more or less how it works. It's like I don't want to like create the impression like you don't need it you can just do whatever you want um would be nice but I yeah you kind of need it all right uh I think that that was a really good coverage of the PhD topic I still you know we didn't get to the question of kind of initial resources I wonder you know if any of you guys have uh, advice, right? Like for, uh, let's say software engineer in Silicon Valley who wants to get into the field, right? And so they are practitioners, so they're not graduate students, you know, they, they just want to like the self learners, right? Essential. Do you think it's feasible to do some self learning in this field or do they need to kind of take classes to go to school? What, what do you guys think? Well, I can give you, um, I can give you some coming from an industry perspective. And uh, I'll take a non-standard approach to answering this in that I, I'm not a fan of like trying to get into the industry. And I, I, think, I think it is a, uh, it's maybe a place of like, it depends on your, your current employment. If, you're, if you have a nice stable employment, you're able to learn this stuff in your spare time. And um, uh yeah, and maybe at least position yourself and your own company as close to quantum computing as possible, like whether that's being involved in machine learning at your company or whatever, you know, there's there's some point within your company that you could probably get to if you're not there. And, and my thought is, um, instead of trying to get into the industry, I would rather, I take this viewpoint of let me build my skills enough and start contributing where the only thing I can do to continue is to join, is to become involved in the industry, more so than trying to find an avenue in for a job. And, you know, each person may have their own you know, needs. Maybe they, you know, they're coming out of school, they need a job or whatever. But um, that's my approach. I think there are plenty of good resources, quantum country, quantum.country, uh, the um, I went through the MIT courses, those are kind of expensive. So I think the one on edX from Berkeley is phenomenal with, um, uh, I'm trying, uh, Vazirani uh, teaching. Um, and 
Yeah, and, and now, and I to the PhD point, I think it is very important to, to have a PhD for the level of formalism and the type of research we're gonna be doing in the field for some time. There's definitely a lot of software engineering jobs, but I'm not so interested in that, to be honest, even though, and hence my point about getting into the industry. Yeah, it'd be cool to be, say I'm working on quantum computing stuff, but I would much rather um, uh, put in the time to become an effective researcher. And that's just my take. Thank you, everyone. This is great perspective. Yeah, absolutely. If you know, if you're able to balance it, right? It's essentially, if you can hold a job um, in the valley and and learn on your own time, right? Uh, that's certainly one option for folks uh, who are curious. And thanks for the merit post at a very cool uh, link in the chat. So thanks for that. So that's uh, by one of the authors of uh, so the Nielsen and Chong's book is like the Bible of quantum computing, in my opinion. And Nielsen is the person who created this website. So um, I didn't use it myself, but um, I think it's really cool. And uh, I ha I think there is a, a clear um, um, th 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 there is no way to like a good a, a good platform to learn quantum computing on your own. Uh, where, whereas there, there is like many, like you can teach yourself machine learning now or like any other emerging field, but it's it's really hard for quantum computing because of the noise, as Alba mentioned in the in the in the field. So um, there's definitely a need for like something like an academy or 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 an online platform to to self to self teach quantum computing. Yeah, I can comment on that. I is, I have started learning that the part of quantum computing. There's a a book uh, says I think it's from this year that has like the, the from Qiskit. Let, let me check it from it, and it has like the interactive things on on all the algorithms. So you can like you, as you say that uh, do the machine learning things. You can try it out and step by step trying to learn it. And also I think that the Qiskit videos that the send in YouTube all the time. They are pretty good ones to start learning like the bits if you don't have any idea of what are, what are you thinking. And one thing that I like is like in the point of quantum computing, like taking like out all the physics that you need and say, okay, this is the operational way to do quantum computing. It's really interesting. Let me, let me see. What is the name of the book? Maybe, maybe I will ping you into the, into the chat, but yeah, I think from my perspective and commenting on, on what else, I, I did my master's in physics and then I went into industry. So, and, and then it's like, it, it was a, like a coincidence that they started doing quantum uh, things in, in during in JP Morgan. So it was like, oh, you have you can have this opportunity, but how I left the, the bank then, but I am trying to do it again. And it's like, as you say, a lot of noise and a lot of things to, to learn. And maybe if you want, I don't know how it's here, but in, I'm, in, I'm in Argentina and it's really complicated to find like jobs for for doing like research or or doing something in industry in quantum computing here in the South. And it is, is another problem. You, you just talk like in United States and in Europe, but in South America it's like a complete different thing. So it's really complicated to do it by your own. But I don't know, there's one thing that I see is like, if you're coming from this software engineering team, it's like Alba said, you need uh, people that need know how to do the, the good quant uh, the, the good uh, engineering, the software engineering. And that's a problem I, I know and in science, like software in science is like very messy scripts and trying to build up is, is like a knowledge that you, you can have from there. So it's like, yeah, I don't know. It's now the, the whole globalization and this uh, the remote works. Maybe you can have a like 
a new perspective of what you want to do. Maybe there's new positions in startups or local, uh, I don't know, you do like meetups. Um, and then people is like trying to engage in, in that, that kind of things. Maybe can start doing to, to learn. Let, let me check the, the book. Thanks, Sasha. Actually, you know, guys, uh, I just wanted to kind of, it occurred to me, you know, Amir and Sasha, you guys spent obviously uh, uh, some time educating yourselves. Maybe uh, we can do um, a specific uh, uh, kind of conversations meeting uh, where folks will just, you know, give talks how they approach the field, right? And, and I think it even applies to the academia, for instance, right? Like, um, because even in universities, a lot of people come into quantum field from other areas right because they started out maybe in some other areas of physics or chemistry or computer science so uh, uh, i would really appreciate it if you guys want to give this talk maybe it does have to be long right because we can do for instance you know uh three 20 minute talks or two 30 minute talks right like we can and we're a bit flexible so um think about it right uh, email me uh you know uh, my email i'll Put it here again so you can always contact me alexi uh, chief scientist at org uh, i had i held the job of a chief scientist at some point so i kind of got this you know uh handle so uh you know if you want to propose a talk you know just send me uh, a note and we uh, i would really appreciate it because i think it would be very useful for others to learn how you learn, like how do you know, because a lot of this is self-learning, discovering resources, right? And even the, in, the, in the research group, kind of how do you navigate the field? Uh, and, and, and maybe like, like you guys already share some links uh, uh, in the chat, maybe you can actually kind of post some slides with some, you know, useful things, which were useful for you, right? Because different things are helpful for different people. So just you know, a request for basically a request for, for for proposals. So maybe we can do the next one yeah, in the summer. Sure. sure. Yeah, I will try to to see if I, I can build something. Mm -hmm. and I will email you. Possible. Yeah, like can can be pretty informal, right? Like you can you can put together some some kind of a few slides and you can talk to kind of what you know uh, your general experience. So would be appreciated. Sure. sure. There, and there I showed the, the, the book that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I have a, a quick question uh, about tequila for Alvaro or Jacob. Um, I guess a real quick, um, what types, so say like we want to create like a group of students who want to work on tequila and help out on the GitHub um, and help with issues. What type of, I guess, prereqs or skills would they need? Um, besides maybe basic like Python coding um, to like effectively contribute to the you GitHub? Uh, depends a little bit on like what uh, what feature like you want to implement. Um, for example, the easiest thing is like if you have like developed some algorithm which just uses tequila and then you want to like integrate this like as a like as a boxed module which you just can call then it's like it's pretty easy like to contribute because um, that usually you don't create a lot of conflicts with that because this is like just your code um, and then you just uh, you just make a pull request and that's it um, and then usually like we will go over the code and like check if like uh, some things could be potential conflicts but that's more or less it if you want to go deeper into the library it marks more or less the same like if you you can add like features or like optimize it like deeper in the library. You make like a pull request, we go over the code and we might notice some things where we see um, that this will cause trouble for other projects, which like usually it should like already be flagged in the automatic like tests which run on GitHub. But like, if not, then we might be like, um, would be good to change this like this and then we can start like discussions. Um, but that's more or less it. Um, if someone like would like plan like to make like really deep changes or something, it might also be like useful like to let us know beforehand. Then we can try like to coordinate. Um, but it's more or less like this: like you need 
you need to have the skills like to implement what you want to do like of course and then it's just like you need roughly to know how git works um Okay. If that's a problem, like people can also like just approach us and say like, how does it work with the forking and pull requests? Like it's, and then we right. can like hint to like the one of the thousand like tutorial videos. <laughs> then uh, like it already worked. Like some some people already like did some contributions. Um, and it worked fine. Yeah, in the end, if you want just to start and get familiarized with it, that it can recommend you to just. You know one algorithm that you have developed or maybe not have developed but uh, you want just you know to practice with that oops sorry and create a tutorial with tequila you know and then we add that to uh, to the tutorial section so after that you got familiarized with it and maybe if you it's it could be a way to just show your work and then after that that tutorial could become a module of tequila you know so after you know the clear idea how to do that, etc. And we also know that, so you can just okay, let's implement that in Tequila directly. And then we also, for instance, if you have some simulator in mind or some other language that you want to to also add as a backend, it's you know as Jacob said, it's okay, let's move, the, let's add another backend, and it's something that is made separately of Tequila, and and you just add that, and of course it has to pass the test, etc. So there are many ways to contribute. So just you know, explore a little bit the GitHub repo and let us know because, of course, we can help. Okay. Well, yeah, the main reason I asked is because um, at Stanford, I guess we're creating a new initiative, uh, like a new course for next quarter, like which starts in January, um, where we put a team of students together, undergraduates or graduates, to work on open source projects or in general, like open with open source resources. Um, I think Tequila would be a great, uh, I guess, like. Uh, package to work with as well and so either one like students could try to just you know improve tequila and fix issues or in general help out you guys in certain yeah, parts of the github but also we also hope in that class to use tequila ideally if, if students don't, or feel comfortable with it as like an actual resource to do quantum simulations um so it's good to know like what sort of background you need and how you both said like you not really too much i suppose it's got to make your own modules and work on them yeah, that would be very cool actually because in the end we also need feedback you know so like for instance, uh, I don't I don't like that the killer implements this syntax in this way for some reason. So maybe we can check and check that. So it's also good that more people start using it. So in the end, the killer skeleton is there. So the idea is that everybody that wants to contribute and add more things, it will be easier to do that because you just have to wrote the module and plug it. And of course, if you want to check the code more in more detail, so you can also do that. So. Yeah, that will be great. So let us know if you decide to do that because we will be more than happy to provide any help that is necessary. Yes, definitely awesome. Thank you. Yeah, there's also the opportunity, like especially if it's like a group of students, um, we could also like add them to a shared Slack channel with us or something. And if they have like questions, we can answer them on the fast way. Because sometimes people are also like afraid, like if they have question, like to raise a GitHub issue because it's like on worldwide display so to say and i think it's like it's a limiting factor often and then it's like then sometimes something doesn't work or they get like some error messages they can just send them to us and then we have a look it's basically what we do like with our like colleagues also who use it um yeah so for like, instance, now we are we have some we will have some mentees of the quantum open source foundation i i see that some of you mentioned the open source thing and they will be working with Tequila. I mean, they have different backgrounds, so they, we will give them different projects to work with. And yeah, the idea is, you know, help us to collaborate and grow the community. And this is something not only open source, but also developed from, from academia, from University of Toronto. So it's, it uh, you know, it's the idea is that everybody around the world, it doesn't matter if you are part of a company or academia, you don't have to ask permission to anyone, just contribute if you want. And yeah, that would be very great. And we have a very list of things that we want to implement. So we can also give you some ideas if you don't know any uh, of what kind of things can you help us to contribute and increase the features in Tequila. Yeah, that's no, great. Maybe over the next month or so, I'll reach out to you guys and we can have a deeper conversation about this. Sure. Yeah, feel free to do so, yeah. So it's like, we have a little bit of overview, like over like, for example, some of those for this open source foundation who are doing some projects. And then if some other students want to do more or less the same, like we can already like prevent that um, they are like, like working on that. And then the next month, someone else like 
adds that and then like they feel like uh then that's a big bump on motivation i would say i'm um, like to avoid like having these kind of like clashes like don't they don't have to, to right. they don't have to share their <laughs> research secrets with us but like <laughs> if the, if it's like uh basic like projects which are fine like to share so um just yeah yeah feel free to reach out like we're more than happy to help with that thank you again all right i think we covered a bunch of topics and so i think we we're kind of two hour mark so i want to thank everyone uh for uh great quantum conversations and i think going forward uh, i think this format really works where we have one main talk in my main theme right and we also have uh kind of a longer general discussion i think really great topics came up we have some links i'll post them uh on the site and i want to thank again uh jeremiah and mert as community organizers again you guys are very welcome to uh to join in and help this is really a community endeavor so thanks a lot everybody really appreciate it and uh send me some proposals for the talks i think you know uh this kind of one-on-one -on -one self learning theme uh would be great for the next time so i'll ask some folks to 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 give talks and send me some proposals and i see you guys again last wednesday of november thank you very much thanks Albert. bye guys have a nice day thank you all thank you guys bye. 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 thank you